all that stuff that you just heard about uh, is really what I live on a daily basis. I am a urologist, but uh, certainly have a, a passion for genetics and all those kind of crazy numbers and letters is, is really what I pay a lot of attention to. And certainly relevant disclosures, uh, part of uh, advisory uh, councils to both Ambry Genetics and uh, GoPath Laboratories. Um, so we're very fortunate in the world of genetic testing in prostate cancer, whether we realize this or not. Um, certainly the current NCCN guidelines are, are actually very generous and, and inclusive for genetic testing. In fact, any man diagnosed with intermediate risk with introductal acribiform uh, features or higher risk or very high risk metastatic type disease is eligible. And certainly if you have a family history of prostate cancer or multiple generations or other cancers, or certainly if you're of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, um, you are also eligible. So very fortunate that we have that opportunity, although as just pointed out, uh, very few uh, eligible patients are actually undergoing this. And the current guidelines really recommend testing for at least uh, 10 genes. And most of these are part of what we call the HBOC, or hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. These include ATM, BRCA1, 2, CHECK2, and PALB2, but also the Lynch syndrome uh, genes. And I also like to highlight that HOXB13, which is a relatively newer discovered gene, not part of that pathway that does increase the risk of prostate cancer is recommended as part of those guidelines. But once we get genetic testing, what do we do with this and what as urologists or medical oncologists, why do we care? And I think that's really the opportunity and the ability to incorporate this into our practice, meaning that genetic testing really has a lot of implications from diagnosis, meaning we should potentially identify those men who are genetically high risk and use that as potentially a screening tool and based on more frequent or earlier screening. We have the ability as a prognostic tool. Once you have localized prostate cancer, are there uh, men who may benefit for more upfront treatment or adjuvant therapies based on their predisposition? Uh, or uh, once men have metastatic cancer, and certainly this was emphasized in many of the talks this morning, is w if you have a mutation, whether germline or somatic, would you benefit from uh, specific chemotherapies that you would respond to? And as I tell my patients, forget uh, you as a patient, what about your family members? Because if you have that mutation, they should also be screened uh, for increased risk. Now when we look and we talk about genetic assessment, and some of this is in guidelines, and some of these are just ancillary tools that are currently available that will hopefully get incorporated into guidelines, we really should be talking about three different things. Is that number one is family history, two is rare pathogenic mutations, and three is a SNP-based polygenic risk score, which is what uh, Raul just talked about. Um, and again, when you look at the contributions to prostate cancer risk in the overall population, their percentages are really overemphasized in that polygenic or genetic risk score, uh, which explains about 20 uh, to 40 percent of why men get prostate cancer, versus what we're all hearing about in the news are those rare pathogenic mutations, with, which in the overall population only explains about 2 to 3 percent of why men get prostate cancer. So to go through each one of those components in a little bit more detail, family history itself we're all used to as clinicians. We gather family history. Most of us, if we ask it, are really focused in on prostate cancer. And of course, that is important, does increase risk. And certainly the number of relatives, their age of diagnosis is important and will increase risk based on the number and earlier age of diagnosis. But we should also be asking about the risk of other relevant cancers, certainly those HBOC uh, cancers. I always kind of run through a list of do you have any family history of breast, ovarian, pancreatic, colorectal, endometrial melanoma, brain cancer in the family? And actually, certainly as men, we're not the best at knowing this information, but we usually can pull some of it. And again, many men will qualify for genetic testing based on this. Rare pathogenic mutations are the next part of a genetic assessment. Again, we've reviewed this, seen the slide before, but really became of importance because men with advanced prostate cancer, between 10 to 15 percent of them, will contain mutations in many of these DNA repair genes. Um, and again, they're called rare because in the overall population, there's only 2 to 3 percent of the population that will actually carry these mutations. And again, the newest on the scene, although potentially one of the most well-studied, are the single nucleotide polymorphisms, or
or SNPs. Again, these are common genetic variations. I like to call them blips throughout your DNA. They themselves don't change a protein structure ultimately or anything like that, but they do increase the risk of disease. Um, there are about 10 million SNPs in uh, the human genome, and certain combinations of these SNPs can be used to estimate risk of certain diseases. So there are panels that are specific for prostate cancer and others for breast cancer, et cetera. And together for prostate cancer, they can explain over 40% of the hereditary disease risk. We uh, use them to calculate a polygenic risk score. We specifically use at our institution a genetic risk score, or a GRS. And basically the easiest way to think about this is that we can count up the number of SNPs for prostate cancer throughout the genome. We put them into a score based on their weighted averages, and then we can average that to the average of the, uh, or normalize that to the average of the population. So if you had a genetic risk score value equal to one, that means average population risk, or about a one in eight lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer. If you have a higher risk, as an example, two, that means twofold higher, or about a one in four chance throughout your lifetime. And certainly lower values are, uh, as an odds ratio, decreased. And again, this is data from the practical network, which really, uh, and this has since been expanded, but initially looked at over 43,000 cases of prostate cancer and a similar number of controls. And the cool part about this is it really personalizes that risk process, because if you have a genetic risk uh, score value in the top decile, you have between a three to six-fold higher risk of developing prostate cancer in your, in, uh, throughout your lifetime. And again, those are the ones that you really want to uh, screen and screen earlier as, as more relevant in current studies. Uh, prospective studies have suggested. And on the cool and the other end of the spectrum is, is if you have a lower risk, you can probably decrease your screening efforts because they can have a, to a 70 to 80 percent lower risk of a lifetime risk. And again, when you compare that to the current gold standard, which is family history, you have a one-time value, about one and a half to two-fold increased risk over your lifetime, but that's every man with a, a, a positive family history of uh, prostate cancer. So again, now knowing the different components, how do we use this? Is every single piece of that data or, or the genetic test results we get, is that relevant for where patients are in that screening of, uh, process? For unaffected individuals, do we really care about most of the DNA damage repair genes? Probably not. But there are, whether it's a polygenic risk score or HOXB13, more relevant tests. And certainly once you're diagnosed, there's going to be those that uh, predispose to more aggressive disease. So just going through some of this, at the time of diagnosis, the relevant tests are going to be your polygenic risk score and certain mutations that increase your risk, whether HOXB13, BRCA2, ATM, and CHECK2. And again, just data from this is, again, the largest uh, series looked at, which was from the UK uh, Biobank. Over 250,000 men were genotyped, and some of them were sequenced. And when we look at the relevance in terms of prostate cancer incidence shown in the blue bars, but certainly the red bars are mortality, um, family history itself increases your risk of prostate cancer, but not necessarily uh, fatal prostate cancer. Rare pathogenic mutations probably do increase the risk of both, but not significant, again, emphasizing the rare paucity nature because it's not powered appropriately in the overall population. But the genetic risk score does increase your risk um, on both at one extreme, meaning that you're more likely to have prostate cancer and among them lethal cancers, and on the other end of the spectrum, if you're low values, uh, decreased chance and decreased probability of lethal cancer as well. So again, we can start thinking about incorporating that uh, as a way to identify men who may benefit from screening. When we look at those men who are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer, certainly it's a reasonable assumption, and certainly some of the data has already been discussed, that if a genetic predisposition to prostate cancer increases your risk of aggressive disease, then potentially you should have some caution in enrolling in active surveillance or focal therapies, because those are the men who are more rapid uh, to progress. And this is just uh, some unpublished data that uh, has been submitted where we did a meta-analysis looking at the 10 guideline uh, recommended genes as, as well as a gene called NBN, um, and certainly five of these genes, ATM, BRCA2, CHECK2, NBN, and PALB2, do increase your risk of metastasis as well as fatal prostate cancer, and as such, uh, if you have one of these, uh, we're, we're currently in further uh, prospectively investigating whether uh, in active surveillance it's a good idea to follow them. Certainly, uh, uh, 
Lori showed that uh, in active surveillance, uh, our series with Hopkins uh, really shows that if you have a, a DNA damage repair gene, that there should be caution. And again, the interesting thing is when these guys uh, are recategorized, they kind of go from zero to 60. They go from grade group one to grade group three or higher. So these mutations do really predispose to more aggressive cancers, and as such, just monitor them closely if that's what you're going to do, or certainly offer them uh, and have that discussion about more upfront treatment. And finally, we all know and uh, has been a focus of many talks is just if you have uh, advanced prostate cancer and certainly castrate resistant and you do have whether a germline or somatic mutation uh, in a DNA repair gene, then you may be able to have a chemotherapy that you may respond well to. Um, certainly this is a review from Heather Chang that really said that uh, and, and talks about that men with DNA uh, double uh, repair gene mutations um, are more responsive to PARP inhibitors, platinum-based chemotherapy, and certainly uh, the Lynch syndrome seem to be uh, responsive to immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors. Um, so based on this, uh, we really do emphasize that genetic testing should be included more frequently in prostate cancer decision making. Uh, do a full genetic assessment that I advocate for family history, a genetic risk score, as well as a panel, a uh, next generation sequencing panel of uh, genes. Um, you should have caution on active surveillance for germline mutations that predispose to more aggressive prostate cancer. Um, and again, understanding the risks of recurrence, um, even once they've been uh, kind of diagnosed, should be uh, had as far as a prognostic tool. And specific germline mutations may be associated with imp improved clinical responses. Thank you.